Uh, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Um, the Standing Committee of Social Development uh, presentation, uh, public presentation about the New Day program. Before we start, I've asked Mr. Blake to open up with uh, our prayer, please. Thank you, Lord, for this day. May many more come. We thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you watch over our family and friends and constituents, wherever they may be. We ask all this in your holy and precious name, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Um, there's a one agenda item, uh, public briefing on the steps for the New Day program. Uh, is everybody any questions regarding to our agenda? Okay, seeing none. Uh, before we, uh, any declaration of conflict of interest? Seeing none, uh, I'll start uh, on my left and get uh, our members to introduce themselves. Good afternoon, Frederick Lake, MLA from Mackenzie Delta. Welcome. Afternoon, Tom Bowley, MLA of Tuneda Willoughby. Good afternoon, Danny McNeely, Satu Region. Good afternoon, Michael Nadley, MLA for Detroit. Julie Green, Yellow Knife Center. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, on my left is Megan Walsh, uh, <coughs> Legislative Assembly Analyst. And on my right is Doug Showerty, our clerk uh, for the committee. Uh, my name is Shane Thompson. I welcome the minister and staff and all the general public to our meeting. Uh, um, my writing is in the handy. At this point in time, Mr. Siebert, if you would introduce your staff and start out with your opening comments. Thank yes, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to brief you uh, on the New Day program. With me today I have Deputy Minister Martin Goldney, Director of Community Justice and Policing, uh, Leanne Gardner, and my special uh, advisor, Stephen uh, Dunbar, I know that domestic violence is an issue that we all care deeply about and that as MLAs we are all committed to seeing government take action to address the alarmingly high rates of this kind of violence in our communities. The New Day program was designed, piloted, evaluated and is now being implemented as an ongoing program precisely because we committed to taking action on the crisis of family violence. I want to assure you that the Department of Justice is not just committed to having a program, we are committed to making the program as effective as possible. We need the best programs we can have because far too many of our families are affected by family violence. The Northwest Territories has the second highest rates in the country and we know that many instances go unreported. It is trite to say that this violence hurts not just the women who experience it, but also their families and children. Tragically, we know from direct and all too frequent experience in our territory that the consequences can be deadly and are always damaging. Women and children are not just hurt physically and it is not just their safety that is risk. Women in violent relationships suffer not only physically and emotionally, they have less opportunity as a result to reach their potential. Children who witness this behavior are also harmed significantly. The social costs of domestic violence are substantial. While I cannot quantify them, I can assure you that this government understands the costs and recognizes the importance of taking meaningful action to prevent the harms caused by violence. While a new day is just one of the measures this government is taking with respect to family violence, it is an important one. Not only do we need to continue providing help and protection to families experiencing violence, we need to support men who are ready to take responsibility and change their behavior. This is very much the goal of the New Day program. Again, this is an area where we all, I believe, strongly agree. I want to emphasize that the resources dedicated to this program have not been diminished. There has been no reduction in the budget. There have, however, been changes to how it is administered to better focus resources towards improving participation and results. This, in my view, is not something that should be controversial, but rather should be something we all support. I have asked officials to provide a presentation on 
the uh, New Day program. And I hope that this presentation helps build an appreciation and awareness of just how deep the commitment to deliver the best program is. This presentation will highlight what we learned from our experience and why we made changes to the program. The response the Department of Justice had to the changes from its partners and how they were considered. How a contractor can continue this important program was secured and the capacity of the contractor to do the work. The challenges and opportunities related to working with community partners and finally how the program will be monitored and evaluated moving forward. I trust that with the information provided you will agree that the department is not blind to the realities of our challenges in, us in addressing the needs of men who use violence in their intimate relationships. More importantly, I hope you will agree that the changes made to the program provide necessary improvements and will help ensure the program is delivered and monitored appropriately. Before I ask uh, Deputy Minister Goldney to take us through the brief presentation, I do want to emphasize a couple of points. As I mentioned, I do believe that we all care about this issue and want to see a dramatic reduction in family violence. I am encouraged by the attention committee has given this issue and recognize this as strong evidence of our shared objective. While it is absolutely appropriate for this committee to scrutinize any program we have, including a new day, I do have to acknowledge a concern. Addressing family violence is an issue that we should be united on. While committee may not always agree with the approach taken, it should be beyond question that my department takes this file seriously and is committed to making the program work as well as it can. Simply leaving the program as it was during the pilot may have served the interests of some, but it is the interests of the men this program is intended for and their families that should matter most. <coughs> I look forward to hearing any specific suggestions committee may have that could improve this much needed program or guide our efforts to reduce family violence. And I'm particularly interested in any improvements that might allow the reach of this program or something like it to extend outside of Yellowknife. Providing more support to men throughout the NWT who are ready to take responsibility and address their violent behavior remains an important objective of the department. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we get to our discussion with your concurrence, I would now ask Mr. Goldney to provide a brief presentation. Thank you. Committee, agree? Agree. Agreed. Okay, Mr. Goldney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so slide one of the presentation offers a, a, a brief outline of how we've, uh, we've structured the presentation. And as the minister noted, we thought we'd start with uh, a description of some of the changes that were made to the New Day program, and I know we've covered some of that ground before, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep my comments brief, but I do think it is important that we, uh, uh, we uh, take the time to explain uh, where there continues to be some, uh, some interest around those changes, and I, I think it's important that we take some time to, uh, again, uh, explain some of the rationale uh, that we had for those changes. Uh, we also have a section to talk about the request for proposal process and uh, our experience with that and how that unfolded. Uh, and then we have a, a section on how we uh, landed with the, the John Howard Society as uh, our new partner and we can talk about the, uh, uh, the competencies uh, that that uh, organization brings to the file. Uh, also thought it important to have a, a bit of a discussion uh, or opportunity for a discussion about how our department is committed to working with community partners on this uh, important file. And finally, I know there was interest in, in uh, committee of the whole as well that, you know, that this program be properly evaluated as it moves forward. So we do want to explain uh, the plans and thinking for how that is expected to happen. So uh, if I can refer uh, committee to slide three uh, where we talk about some of the changes and I think uh, you know, one of the most uh, important changes that we made was really around trying to find a delivery model that would allow uh, more flexibility. Uh, so something that might see groups starting more often, uh, so men who use violence in their relationships uh, can be targeted effectively uh, and we know from, uh, from experience that uh, 
they should be given every opportunity to complete the program and sometimes that might require some interruption. Uh, so having that increased modularity uh, introduced we felt was very important to uh, uh, to see uh, more men uh, complete uh, the therapy uh, program as it was designed. Uh, the next bullet we have is improve uh, connections to community supports. So, uh, and I think as we we mentioned in our last briefing to to this committee, I think there was recognition that uh, this is a challenging program, and there are complex needs for many of the men who uh, seek the type of support this program offers. Uh, some aren't always ready to take the program. And we need to be uh, certain that we're connecting them uh, as best we can to the supports that might uh, take them to uh, a position where they could be ready for a program like the New Day. Uh, and I think we should uh, acknowledge that part of that is in recognition that the New Day program itself, while it's important, you know, is not and cannot be considered, you know, a, a one-size-fits-all uh, program that is going to uh, help all men because all men aren't going to be ready to uh, to take the to take the program uh, another change that we made uh, and we did cover this uh, the last time we uh, presented to committee and I think there was some uh, perhaps apprehension from committee that we would be able to uh, introduce a coordinator position within the department in the time that we had. I'm happy to report that uh, that position has been filled and there's good work happening there. Uh, but the, uh, uh, and the reasons for having that increased administrative support within the departments uh, were because the, the, the pilot showed that there were challenges in in terms of data gathering and, and interpretation, as well as uh, accurate communication about the purpose, scope, and outcome of the program. So having that coordinator position uh, allows for data gathering to be consistent and closely monitored, as well as uh, uh, provides for consistent messaging about the program to stakeholders and partic uh, potential participants. Uh, Another change that we made was with respect to how the clinical supervision will work. Uh, and uh, again, clinical supervision is, is important. It's there to ensure safety of, of the men that are participating in the program, and it's uh, to provide support for uh, facilitators. Uh, so it, it is a very important safety tool for, the, for uh, the GNWT to consider to ensure that the program is being delivered as contracted and in an ethical and responsible way. Uh, so under the previous model, uh, contractors were required to secure clinical supervision, and these supervisors reported to the contractor. Now, in, in most cases, you know, that, uh, that could uh, work fine, and a facilitator would be expected to uh, heed any ethical safety or management concerns raised by the, the clinical supervi supervisor. Hypothetically, however, it's... Uh, Easy to imagine that you know under the, the old model, there's the, the potential for a facilitator to disagree with or ignore their clinical supervisor, and this could put the, the clinical supervisor in a, in a really uncomfortable and awkward uh, uh, position. So having the, the clinical supervisor uh, report uh, to the GNWT any challenges uh, that they might be encountering provides for that improved safety and oversight of the program. Now, the other change uh, that, that, that we, we, we must note is uh, you know, how we structured uh, the, the payment for uh, the delivery of the program. Uh, so the, the pilot showed uh, the delivery of the program essentially equated to part-time hours for two facilitators. Uh, that was clearly demonstrated in, 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 in the reports the department received about uh, the work being undertaken for uh, those facilitation uh, functions. So we thought the fee-for-service model was the, kind of the, the best fit uh, to meet the potential demand for the service, and it, it really allows uh, for the resources to be focused uh, where we feel they are needed to be focused, which is on uh, providing that facilitation. Uh, service, uh, and that's frankly where they've uh, always been intended. 
And having that fee-for-service type of arrangement, uh, the thinking was, you know, this could also make it easier to allow for multiple facilitators or a situation where uh, there's uh, many facilitators that might be available uh, to uh, help deliver the program and eventually expand the program uh, and build up that uh, uh, that cohort of skilled facilitators from which experience can be drawn uh, and obviously uh, we have in mind uh, potential future expansion being uh, a goal as well. Now the model uh, still provides for a, a contribution agreement uh, for program intake. Uh, so the, the new model continues to recognize, as the, the previous one did, uh, you know, that there is value in having an NGO uh, partner and a relationship because they have, frankly, a, a, a different relationship with the public and potential clients than the Department of Justice does. We're well aware that uh, you know, part of this program requires men to accept responsibility and move forward and, and having them uh, have to come to the Department of Justice to admit uh, behaviors that are criminal is you know, uh, not ideal. Uh, ideally, you know, we might find ways to, to overcome those challenges if we had to, but we do recognize that ideally we'd be providing a different kind of storefront experience for potential clients. Uh, so we did break that out from uh, the RFP, which the RFP was focused on the facilitation services, but we made clear throughout the RFP process with prospective clients that uh, uh, there would be the possibility of a contribution agreement with an NGO. And again, recognizing that this additional flexibility also provided the potential that we might see facilitators not affiliated with any particular NGO. Uh, uh, come forward. So that was pretty much the, the thinking and the rationale for uh, the changes. Uh, we didn't make any changes to uh, the curriculum of the program. That stayed the same. But as we've been saying, it's really those management features and administration features of the, uh, uh, of the program uh, that were introduced. So if I could just uh, direct committee to uh, slide four under uh, request for proposals. Uh, and consultation, of course, is, is really important. Uh, and you know, I, I think it's worth noting uh, that the department does recognize the value that it has in its community partners. Uh, and that when this program was developed, uh, it was established in close partnership with the, the Coalition Against Family Violence. We all looked at options that uh, were out there, models that were out there, programs that were out there, and essentially adapted a, curricula, a curriculum from another program already uh, established in Southern Canada. Now, as I mentioned, the new model uh, only makes administrative and delivery changes, not changes to the program curriculum itself. Uh, or the program or the curriculum delivery. Uh, so recognizing that, we did have to balance uh, the need to consult on these kind of changes to the administration of the program versus following a fair and transparent uh, procurement process. And we knew uh, that members of the coalition and, in fact, other community members had uh, expressed some interest in delivering the program. They would made those interests explicit to the department. Uh, so the department reasonably anticipated uh, there would be interest from organizations or even individuals uh, who were not part of the coalition, uh, and we needed to make sure that no one proponent, proponent had an unfair advantage uh, over another. Uh, now that said, we did recognize the, the importance of uh, explaining the rationale for the changes, and, and, and we did uh, when we uh, got into the RFP process itself, uh, did take steps. Uh, so for the development of the RFP, first internally, uh, the department used much of the language from the last request for proposals uh, uh, that, that was contemplated in, in terms of requirements for the facilitators, uh, made the appropriate revisions to reflect the changes in delivery and administration of the program, including the funding model, those changes that I spoke about earlier. Uh, and uh, as discussed earlier as well, uh, 
left the intake provisions uh, outside of the RFP, and we made changes to the clinical supervisor, uh, or because the clinical supervisor will now report to uh, the GNWT, and it'll be up to the GNWT to secure those services, uh, they were left out of the RFP as well. Uh, and as we were uh, developing the uh, RFP, of course, we worked very closely with uh, uh, Procurement Shared Services on the development of the RFP, uh, and Procurement Shared Services uh, administered the actual uh, RFP process. Uh, and as committee is, is aware, you know, we do have procurement guidelines and objectives that are there to establish, you know, high level of confidence in the procurement process uh, and ensure that all public sector procurement is carried out in an open, fair, consistent, efficient, and competitive manner. Uh, and so we, we absolutely followed those. And, that, and it is important to recognize the GNWT's procurement uh, framework, and it's built around those principles of competition and transparency and uh, also considers the, the socioeconomic impact of government contracting. Uh, so that was done, uh, and I think as we reported last time to the committee at the time, we had uh, uh, high hopes that that RFP process would yield uh, some interest. Uh, but we also recognized that we needed to be really clear with potential proponents, you know, what the changes were uh, from the previous model and how they worked. So we did hold uh, a proponents meeting on March 14th, uh, shortly after the RFP uh, was made public. And proponents meetings are, are, are typically uh, used for large and complex construction agreements. It's rel they're relatively rare in, in other settings, but the department wanted uh, uh, to provide local organizations uh, as much opportunity as possible to ask questions and understand the RFP. Uh, and you know, we, we also appreciate NGOs are, are, are not often engaged in this type of contracting process. They're much more familiar with, with, uh, with uh, contribution agreements. Uh, so we wanted to make uh, absolutely clear uh, what the expectations were for the proposals that we were soliciting. Uh, the intention was pro to provide as much information and to encourage as many organizations to submit proposals uh, as were interested. So we did have good attendance at that, uh, uh, at that proponents meeting. You know, we had uh, representatives from the Salvation Army, the Tree of Peace, three individuals and, uh, and one private sector counseling organization from uh, Southern Canada participated uh, via teleconference. We heard many, many questions uh, that were either asked at the proponents meeting or were provided in written questions to, to procurement shared services. And, the, and we did take uh, what we heard at the proponents meeting or through those written questions and actually did amend the RFP document to reflect what was heard. Uh, as a consequence, uh, we did extend the deadline for uh, proposals to be submitted. Now, just uh, I think it's important to just spend a little bit of time on some of the themes that we heard from potential, uh, potential proponents through that process through the, the proponents meeting and, uh, and the taking of uh, questions uh, so, reporting was uh, was one of the themes where we heard uh, some concerns, and uh, there was some clarification sought. Uh, you know, the department clarified that reporting of client progress through the curriculum would be streamlined uh, between the GNWT coordinator and the facilitators. We very much see that as an added feature for the facilitators so they can focus on uh, the work uh, that they do best and be relieved from some of the burdens of the administration. Uh, and, and the reporting of, of progress or attendance that the, the client requests uh, to occur at probation services, parole, social services, wherever that might be, uh, will also be done by uh, the coordinator. So we, we, we clarified that. There was concern around the, the cultural content uh, Proponents indicated concerns that cultural components were left out of the, the model. Uh, so we did clarify that you know, this is important uh, and that the proponents should indicate uh, their experience and background and trauma in their proposals as that experience would be considered an asset in, uh, in the proposal. 
Uh, facilitator experience. Uh, concerns were raised about uh, facilitator having uh, professional designations and uh, what we said in the RFP about potential conflicts. So uh, the department clarified that the, uh, the intention of the conflict clause in the RFP was not to say that wherever there's a conflict, uh, folks will be disqualified, uh, but it was really uh, just to be uh, upfront uh, about the requirements of successful, uh, uh, for successful opponents to declare uh, potential conflicts. You know, for example, if a, if a facilitator was already counseling the client's spouse, uh, you know, the GNWT would require that the, fac the facilitator uh, disclose that, uh, that, uh, that there was a conflict uh, that existed and you know, we'd find ways to uh, consider managing the, those, those conflicts. Uh, proponents also indicated concerns about the RFP not explicitly uh, requiring facilitators to have any formal education or prior experience in trauma. Uh, and although, you know, that was by design initially. The department had intended to leave formal education uh, out of the RFP because we did anticipate that there might be opportunity for elders or others with clear group facilitation experience uh, to be able to submit proposals and with the proper training uh, be able to, uh, uh, to deliver this type of uh, uh, program. But uh, uh, the department ended up making that change uh, in the RFP to address the concerns that we heard. Uh, and I should be uh, clear, there, there were never any concerns raised at either the proponents meeting or the 50 plus questions that we received uh, electronically around uh, the uh, around the suggested term in the RFP, and we'll get to uh, you know, how that was uh, changed in a moment. Uh, but we had no indication that the term was a, a disincentive for anybody considering uh, submitting a proposal. And you know, the rationale for the initial term in the RFP uh, was for a contract uh, uh, to be entered into until uh, uh, March 31st, 2018, uh, but it also made clear that there was uh, uh, an explicit, uh, explicitly clear that there was a, uh, a reasonable expectation that that could be extended upon the agreements uh, of uh, any successful uh, proponents. And the reason we did this was because we, uh, uh, we wanted to encourage anybody that was interested in the uh, in this type of program to make a, uh, a proposal without necessarily requiring them to make a long-term commitment uh, and we felt that was uh, uh, that was uh, an important uh, thing to uh, to do when we were in that context of trying to solicit as many proposals as we could uh, and we thought that made uh, that made sense so the RFP was issued. Uh, there were uh, four addendums as a result of the ongoing dialogue we were having with uh, potential proponents. All those addendums, uh, including those that were in response to questions where somebody would pose a question in writing, we wanted to make sure every uh, registered uh, uh, potential proponent had an opportunity to consider those questions and those responses, uh, that they were uh, received uh, for uh, and uh, provided to all potential proponents who had indicated a, uh, uh, an interest in the proposal. So uh, as committee is aware, the RFP process was unsuccessful. Uh, it, it didn't produce any proposals and uh, you know, we, were, we were disappointed. Uh, uh, but that did tell us something. You know, we had no indication uh, that running the RFP again uh, would be successful, and we needed a program in place uh, uh, by the end of the contract term with the Tree of Peace. So, uh, and given the, the repeated concerns that we've heard from many, including from this committee, that we needed to, uh, to strive for a seamless uh, a carryover, uh, that did uh, uh, lead us to. Uh, to certain decisions about what we could do uh, to try and make that happen. Uh, and really, uh, you know, after the RFP process closed unsuccessfully, we were uh, in a sole source uh, uh, context where, you know, 
having gone and followed the, the procurement uh, guidelines, been open, fair, competitive, uh, transparent, and not having interests, you know, we've felt confident that uh, this does fit within uh, the proper context of when a sole source contract for something like this uh, should be entertained and considered. Uh, so we certainly consulted with procurement shared services about our options, and uh, that was uh, some of the advice uh, that we received. We also consulted with the Tree of Peace on two different occasions to ask if they were interested in entering into a contract for the delivery of the program uh, under the new model. Um, both times they indicated they were not interested in uh, the program under the new model. Uh, so uh, although there's been some criticism of the, the administrative changes we have made, uh, we've also heard from local organizations uh, that the public and, or, and, and political climate around the program, frankly, makes them hesitant uh, to, uh, to be part of the project. And we thought that's really unfortunate, but that is important context that helps explain you know, some of the, 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 the low rates around the, uh, the response to proposals. Uh, and we know there have been strained relationships between uh, members of the coalition. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, uh, but we've heard, uh, as I mentioned, that, that that strain contributed to hesitation on the part of some organizations to, to get involved with the New Day program for fear of having this negative uh, attention directed at them. Uh, so we did look at not just the Tree of Peace, but we looked at other organizations as well. Uh, as I mentioned, some expressed interest, but trepidation. Uh, but we did also... Uh, consider uh, the John Howard Society as a, as a potential partner. Uh, so on slide five, uh, well, perhaps uh, I can direct the committee to, sl to slide, slide five. And I think it's important to note the, you know, the expectations for the John Howard Society are consistent with the RFP when it comes to their role and responsibilities. It's entirely uh, consistent. Uh, you know, they're contracted to provide facilitators for a 24-week program, including providing some meeting space. Uh, they're expected to work with the GNWT coordinator to oversee the contract, oversee client files, and, and uh, clinical supervision, uh, the clinical supervision contract. Uh, so, you know, as part of our our, our consideration of potential partners, you know, of course we consider the capacity of organizations to deliver this program. And we do have to acknowledge uh, uh, that in our experience over the past uh, uh, several months, the John Howard Society has made considerable improvements uh, in the administration of their organization. Uh, they've met the terms of the contribution agreement for the delivery of community justice uh, and restorative activities in Yellowknife. Uh, so we do have that experience, and that did provide us some comfort that uh, they're here as an organization with, uh, with some capacity. And of course, the John Howard Society has a, a strong connection to all parts of the justice system. Uh, and in other parts of the country, the John Howard Society uh, delivers family violence programs, and there is uh, support and expertise from colleagues across the country uh, available to the NWT John Howard Society. Uh, uh, and the John Howard Society uh, shares common values and their ideals, frankly, align quite nicely with what the New Day program is trying to achieve. Uh, and I'll note, uh, uh, you know, the John Howard Society in British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario deliver similar programs uh, to help men who use violence in their intimate uh, relationships. So the contract terms for the John Howard Society, I'll try and move a little faster here. Uh, it's, a, it's up to 575000 over the term of the contract based on that fee-for-service model. Of course, uh, you know, we would be happy to see demand uh, use all of those resources. That, uh, I think, would be a, a good sign. But there is, we also had to recognize if the demand's not there and those, those resources aren't being used for that purpose, we should have the flexibility to find other ways to, uh, to support this effort with those, uh, with those resources. Uh, facilitators, uh, they'll have qualified counselors with a strong cultural connection to the NWT and the John Howard Society uh, will secure these facilitators. 
And there's nothing, uh, and I want to emphasize, there's nothing to suggest that the facilitators hired by the John Howard Society will be less qualified or less capable in, in any way to those that are currently contracted to facilitate the program. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, another component with the John Howard Society will, is expected to be that contribution agreement uh, with them to help support the intake components. Uh, just a few slides left, uh, so I'll, and, and again, I'll go quickly. Uh, under community partners, I think you know, we, we do have to restate again uh, that the department is, is really committed to working with all of our community partners. Uh, the Department of Justice has been involved uh, with the Coalition Against Family Violence for many years. In fact, the, we're, uh, as far as GNWT membership, it's been declining on that, uh, on that coalition. We're the last department that uh, uh, participates uh, uh, consistently and directly uh, in those coalition meetings. And I do want to acknowledge that the Coalition Against Family Violence is a, it's an important organization. It has a unique it's a unique kind of uh, territorial interagency uh, group that brings together government and non-government agencies to share information and undertake projects and address family violence uh, issues. And the purpose of the coalition uh, was always to increase awareness of family violence issues for the residents, to bring organizations with a shared objective and their own expertise uh, to develop, establish, and implement uh, uh, specific actions or initiatives to address family violence issues uh, and to work collectively and, and collaboratively uh, to reduce uh, family violence and to more effectively respond to, uh, to family violence issues in the Northwest Territories. Uh, you know, that's certainly a goal we support and will continue to support, uh, but we also have to acknowledge that there have been challenges uh, and it's difficult for any type of coalition to reach consensus on every issue. Uh, there are sometimes competing issues. We don't expect uh, our partners to always agree with the departments. Uh, we think that's you know, fair and understandable, but what we do expect is you know, having the ability to have that respectful uh, and constructive dialogue with any of our partners, and we'll certainly uh, be working to, uh, to maintain those relationships and build upon those relationships where we can. Uh, and as I mentioned, there, there's not always uh, agreement within the coalition on matters. It is making it very challenging. Uh, the membership has shifted uh, a little. It's not always organizations with their own capacity and expertise. There are individual uh, members now part of that organization. Uh, so it, it is a challenge, but we will continue to work with any partner uh, that uh, is willing to uh, to work with the uh, uh, with the Department of Justice, uh, particularly where our, our, our objectives and our focus align, uh, uh, and we're particularly interested in working with uh, with organizations who who want to find ways to prevent family violence. And as I mentioned, I expect that uh, collaboration to continue. Very quickly, the the last slide on evaluation. Uh, so. Mentioned this at our, our last committee briefing on the subject. The previous evaluation was useful. It's helpful to do those types of evaluations, but we always, as I noted at, at the last evaluation, have to uh, review these things somewhat critically because we know from our own experience and our experience with outside evaluators, it's always a challenge uh, for folks to secure opinions from uh, not just the supporters of the program and the participants who are keen and eager to share their experiences, but it's particularly challenging to connect with those that didn't have different experiences and are perhaps not as supportive. Uh, so we do have to, uh, when we look at uh, the needs of a program, we do have to look and be informed by our own experiences as well. Um, quickly, the, the evaluation framework, and when we were in the Committee of the Whole, this, this came up as well. Uh, we do want to make it uh, absolutely clear that there are some lessons to be learned from you know, how the last program was evaluated and what we can do moving forward. Uh, we absolutely uh, want to continue evaluating and monitoring uh, the, this program to ensure that it's working as well as it can. Uh, 
and frankly we expect it to evolve we expect lessons to be learnt as we go along just as we might expect from any of our programs and that's really important but what's really what's also important is you know having a clear expectation of what we we call the logic model at the start which is really that road map that shows how the program works what steps are taken to get the results expected and we know that we do have a logic model I think we said we were working on a logic model and and I hope that wasn't taken as suggesting we don't have one what we are saying is we recognize the need to work on the logic model to make sure that we have the appropriate expectations and measures for success within that model because we don't want to just focus on completion rates those are important but it's not the whole story we we want to look at uh, other potential measures for success and have those understood uh, you know what is success it starts with defining what it what is success for the program you know is it longer periods between incidents is it just more men going through the program is it the victims are, are feeling safer after their partners participate in the program and, and for how long uh, is it just looking at the program completion and uh, reoffending uh, we, we would suggest it's not just those things it's perhaps a combination but we do need to have you know a clear understanding of what we want to measure uh, right from the outset so I think that is frankly a lesson that we learned from uh, from our experience with the with the program uh, finally there's a there's a bullet uh, on that slide about safety uh, of victims and I do think we, we, we need to be careful on this one I, I just think it, it has to be noted we have to be careful in how we communicate around this program uh, and I say we, we want to be careful we want to encourage as many men who are ready to take this program to take this program uh, we want the, we certainly don't want to create uh, the impression that it uh, won't be helpful for them uh, but the reality is we, we can't uh, claim that it is 100 percent effective and will solve all of the problems uh, and we do have a real concern around some of that messaging uh, because it could lead to a false sense of security for the partners and families of uh, the folks that might be interested in this program uh, so I'm just flagging that as a as something that we all need to uh, to work to manage and that is a bit more of an explanation for why we saw additional value in having that coordinator uh, position with, with uh, uh, the ability to uh, to have consistent messaging uh, around the program uh, applied so that uh, was sorry my uh, ran a little over time there mr. chair but that is the uh, the presentation thank you thank you mr. Golney uh, mr. Bolio Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask the department if um, use a GNWT procurement guidelines for the RFP only and moving forward um, with this, um, um, uh, I guess, uh, project uh, continue to uh, apply GNWT procurement guidelines for all uh, procurements, such as uh, procuring um, facilitators and so on. Thank you, Mr. Bolio. Mr. Golding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we do expect to follow the uh, procurement guidelines, certainly uh, where it's the GNWT procuring services. And we do feel that we've we've taken pains to follow those guidelines. As I mentioned, there was the RFP process, and then there was the uh, the separate uh, sole source uh, contracts. You know, all of those fit within. <coughs> Uh, our procurement objectives and guidelines uh, for the securing of facilitators that's now the responsibility of the John Howard Society and we have no indication that they're not going to be fair about how they uh, uh, how they secure those those services under under our contract so thank you mr. chair thank you mr. Golden mr. Bolio. thank you um, mr. chairman I was not thinking of anything that would be unfair but um, I'm thinking the very first statement made by the Department of Flexibility 
I see that um, the GNWT will provide administrative administration uh, and clinical supervision. Is there a thought that uh, the GNWT, while providing administration, also provide all of the, the accounting services as well? Thank you, Mr. Bull. Minister Siebert. No, uh, as, as mentioned, we do see the uh, the benefit of having a uh, non-governmental organization uh, be involved in this, as uh, was mentioned by Mr. Goldney. So I don't think uh, that model is going to change. The government will be providing more assistance in the administration uh, of the program. That's the main change as we see it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm looking at the sole source contracting uh, provisions on the government website, and it says um, sole source contracts uh, have to meet the following criteria. The goods and services are urgently required, and delay would be injurious to the public interest, or only one party is available and capable of performing the contract, or the contract is valued at less than $5,000, although I have a feeling that that uh, number is actually, this. I think this is an old number, the procurement number now through sole sourcing is higher, but having said that, it's not $500,000 either. So how does, how does um, sole sourcing this contract uh, fit within this criteria? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Siebert. Well, I think we all felt that the, it was, uh, there was a matter of urgency involved here. We uh, didn't want to have any breaks in the, uh, in the contract, and as uh, I'm sure members will recall, we extended the program uh, six months just to avoid that, uh, that possibility. So we saw there was an urgency in getting a, a contractor in place and therefore moved ahead with this. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Siebert. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The second point here is that only one party is available and capable of performing the contract. Um, th that clearly is not the case. Uh, and with this particular contract, there were a number of entities who were capable. So uh, can you explain uh, why you felt it was necessary to sole source this? Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, those... Uh, requirements of the, the sole sourcing or ORs, uh, so not all three components have to be there, but we did, uh, we're very mindful uh, that, you know, the principles of, uh, of our procurement policies are to, you know, where we can provide for a competitive process to give opportunity to everybody. Uh, I think it has to be acknowledged uh, that in these circumstances, we had just come out of an RFP process that did try and solicit interest uh, broadly, and in fact, as broadly as we could. Uh, so we didn't have, you know, having had no proponents uh, step forward through that process, didn't have a concern that we were denying potential uh, partners the opportunity to, uh, to contract with us, that that opportunity was there and provided through the RFP process. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Mr. Nettle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, ultimately, my interest is to ensure that uh, men can access programs and of course, if they get treatment, then you know we're dealing with the mandate commitment of uh, at least uh, tackling the whole issue of family and violence in the NWT. And so, we wanted to ensure that services could be brought to family, and plus, in the interest and safety of the well-being of children too. Um, I'm I'm a bit concerned about the progress and the process of this whole initiative. Um, um, I'm, I'm providing a commentary leading up to a question on the first page of your presentation, but I mean, I can't help but uh, feel very disappointed that, uh, you know, what I see now is a very, a very uh, swirling political storm on the new Jeep program. And, uh, you know, and services have to continue, and, 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 and men need to be assured that they could seek help. Ultimately, I think that's the intention of the program. Um, the point that I wanted to seek some clarity on is um, on community partners, whether that makes reference to community partners within the city of Yellowknife or is it community partners outside of Yellowknife? Because thus far, what I see from this effort is that this new day program is essentially a Yellowknife program. 
Thank you, Mr. Natalie. Minister Siegel. Although we recognize that the uh, current partners uh, will be within Yellowknife, we are hoping to expand this uh, outside of Yellowknife uh, to other partners. So that is our aim. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nedley. <clears throat> well, that's encouraging. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask is regarding uh, the, the, uh, the arrangement with the John Howard Society. How would um, that arrangement ensure there's a level, a level and reflection of indigenous perspective? I know, uh, you know, people that have gone through experiences would like to, you know, be at least by help by people that have shared shared experiences, and so, um, and and plus some cultural rele relevance in terms of how they could relate to a person. So, how could an indigenous um, perspective be reflected, be assured? to be part of this process. I see. Thank you, Mr. Natalie. Mr. Goldman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And our, our expectations are for the facilitators hired by the John Howard Society that they have the relevant cultural competency. So it, it really hasn't changed from the last delivery uh, model with that respect. Uh, I, I, we do acknowledge this is a, a program for all men. It's not limited to just Indigenous men, and uh, it's, not, it's certainly not just Indigenous men who, uh, who use violence. Um, but at the same time, we do recognize, as the member states, that the importance of having those cultural competencies, having an understanding of uh, the background and the experience that uh, many of the men that uh, are expected to participate in this program will have. So we do uh, fully expect and anticipate that anybody taking on this work will have that, uh, that knowledge. And, and uh, uh, although we can't guarantee uh, you know, that all facilitators will be Indigenous, we can uh, certainly strive to work for it and ensure that all facilitators have those cultural competencies and that knowledge and that background just as was the case previously. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Golding. Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've heard um, it said here that uh, departments of the view that it followed all, followed all of the contracting policies and so on. I'm looking at uh, contracting policy 4.7, evaluating proposals. And at the end, it talks about negotiations. So it says here, after the proposals have been evaluated, the purchaser may find that one or more of the proposals are clearly superior. And here's the part that's interesting. Negotiations may be undertaken with the apparent winner or with a short list of proponents. Such negotiations may be done to clarify points contained within the proposal, contract, terms, or minor modifications to the scope of the work. So I'm trying to figure out how we went, and I asked the minister this uh, in the house, how we went from a one-year RFP to a four-year contract without an opportunity for other party, potentially interested parties, to uh, um, express an interest in this or even submit their own proposals. So um, was all of this done according to the, uh, the contracting policies? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, the member is quite right. Had there been responses to the RFP and there have been multiple responses that had to be evaluated, uh, we could have used those types of uh, uh, evaluation tools and negotiations to come up with, uh, uh, with a single proponent. Uh, and in fact, you know, that's largely how it worked the last time. Uh, we, we put the New Day program out to an RFP where there was more than one, uh, uh, one proponent. Uh, but the reality is that that speaks to the requirements of the RFP process. Uh, outside of the RFP process, it's a different context when we're in negotiations for a sole source contract. So thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Goldie. Mr. Riley. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So can um, someone remind me what the limits are for sole source contracts? Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Seward. I'm not certain. I know it's no longer 50,000 or 5,000, as was mentioned uh, by Ms. Green, but uh, I'm not certain what the uh, 
the new amount is. I thought it was 50, but I'm not sure. There are different. Uh, it depends on the type of contract, I yeah, believe, for, also. For consulting and, uh, for consulting and professional <coughs> services, it's different. But, uh, Mr. Minister, you want me to go to Mr. Golan? Sure. Okay, thank you. Minister Siebert, Mr. Golden. And I'm sorry I don't have uh, uh, the, the figures in front of me, so I can't fully answer or perhaps even adequately answer uh, partially that, uh, that question. We do and we are aware that there are different limits for different kind of contractors, a lower limit for consulting services and professional services and a higher limit for, uh, for other types of services. We think this would be in the, in the higher limit. Uh, but the sole source contracting rules do provide for exceptions. Uh, when they're outside of those limits, uh, and uh, so there is still that flexibility there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Goley. Um, I'm just looking at something here and from the Minister of Finance, and it says under 100,000, but that's agriculture and or architecture and architecture and engineering contracts. But it's out under 100,000, and it's 20 professional services uh, to 50,000. So that's where that information, just so everybody's aware of that. Ms. Minister Siebert. I think that it has to be remembered that we did go out to uh, seeking RFPs uh, first. Our RFP went out, and we were uh, seeking bidders. There were no bidders. I think this would certainly fall, in, fall into the uh, area of an exception because I think we all recognize that uh, this is an ongoing program that we didn't want to have any gaps with it. Therefore, I think the uh, going to the John Howard Society, uh, previous um, attempts to uh, have a response to the RFP having failed was entirely justified in these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Siebert. M Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I too struggle with uh, unfamiliar waters here, but um, you're neglecting to leave out the other option in your procurement process of extension of existing program to me that was, I would say, operating with a lot of success and measurables in that area. Take walk-in clients, for example, those avenues for walk-in clients. So you had something that was designed, made in the north, by the north, for the north. And now you've got something that's going to be uh, measured on uh, the, the results of uh, what I feel is very similar to my colleague from the day show saying that... Uh, I don't really think you're going to get all that much results. So I, I look forward to, and for the record, saying if you can give us quarterly progresses on this new system and the new system and the criteria in the curriculum has never changed. But yet uh, questions in the House say that if the curriculum has never never change and, and, and the design of delivery never really change. We're seeing immediate results here. People from the former staff are leaving and, and engagements into the incarceration offenders is not there, but yet was there. So that adds to my confusion on, on really if this is, this is the right choice. So I, I just point out that that as notice to say, let's compare your actuals to your your objectives. Your objectives through the procurement process followed guidelines, but neglected one. And let's see if these objectives are really meeting the targets as set out by a quarterly report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Minister Siebert. Yes, as members will know, we did extend the uh, program for a six-month period. I'm sure everyone will also recall is that we had a, uh, an evaluation done of this, um, this program, which suggested several 
uh, changes which we incorporated um, into the RFP. Um, there will be ongoing evaluation, as Mr. Goldie mentioned, uh, uh, any, any program, this or other, other programs of this type clearly have to be evaluated. This program will be made in the North, uh, North program. There's, there's really no change in that. The old one was, as this one will be. So I don't know if Mr. Goulding wants to add anything to that, but um, I, I'd like to point out that we felt that some changes needed to be made. They were not terribly significant changes, often dealing with administration, and we incorporated those changes into the RFP. Didn't have any bidders, so we have gone out to the John Howard Society. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Siebert. Mr. Goulding? No, okay. Thank you. Mr. McNeil. I'm there, Mr. Chair. Okay. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Why did the department make a decision to make this sole source contract for four years and not two years or three years, um, which would have brought it more within the guidelines for sole source contracting? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think the the change really was a reflection of the, the confidence and uh, willingness of the partner to enter into a long-term uh, enter into a long-term model, a longer-term model that was uh, anticipated in the RFP initially. And, and as I mentioned, you know, we kept the RFP model uh, somewhat shorter, anticipating that not every proponent might be interested in being locked in. Some might want to try it on, frankly, and, and not want to have a long-term commitment. Uh, but we did see some value once we were outside of the RFP process and into the, uh, the sole source uh, discussions with the John Howard Society of having longer-term stability. We were also, frankly, uh, comfortable in our working relationship, recognizing that this is a partner that, that largely depends on having a good working relationship with uh, the Department of Justice. So we do think uh, that if there are requirements for adjustments uh, along the way that uh, we will have, uh, uh, there's much less risk, let me put it that way, that we won't find success in making those adjustments. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Golden. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you. Um uh, I, I guess I, I've said previously that I think this is a bad faith move uh, on the government's part because uh, it, there are, may have been other NGOs that would have uh, bid on the basis of a four-year contract and not on the basis of a nine-month con uh, nine contract, but they didn't have that opportunity. Um, and so... Uh, and, and so that, that's the way that that went. Um, I want to talk about risk analysis. Um, the John Howard Society fired its executive director, dissolved its board, uh, walked out on its commitments to the Victim Services Program, and now they have a contract for $577,000. What is the risk that they are not going to deliver on that? What kind of analysis did you do? Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Golden. Thank you. Uh, and certainly that was very much considered as part of uh, the capacity, and we would have done this for any organizations that we were considering. Do they have the capacity uh, to carry this uh, forward? And the member's quite right. There was a, a bit of turbulence in the not-too-distant past of the John Howard Society, uh, but they didn't fully walk out of their commitments. Uh, you know, They were put in a difficult spot by not having an executive director there for a while, but they... Uh, did continue to be a valued partner and continue to work with uh, the department while interim measures were put in place to ensure the continuity of services around, uh, around that particular contract and that particular program. And as I mentioned, uh, we do take great uh, comfort and confidence from the experience, the, the much more recent experience, where we've seen tremendous improvements uh, within the John Howard Society to how that particular contract and those functions were being uh, being performed. So uh, that really did uh, lessen some of that apprehension and risk for us. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Golden. Mr. Nudley. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a one or two to point out that I really think um, this department needs to plan C, um, meaning that if all, 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 all else fails uh, with the John Howard Society, you need to have a backup plan. Um, the point that I wanted to make is just to try to understand how 
On a go-forward basis, you know, there is a formal understanding. Things have been formalized. Why would men that need help go to the John Howard Society for help? Thank you, Mr. Natalie. Minister Sieber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can answer at least part of that question, certainly. The John Howard Society, of course, as we know, has been around for a long time, since the beginning of Canada, actually. And I know that the John Howard Society in British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario deliver very similar programs to this. So I am confident in their ability to deliver. Mr. Golding might want to add something to that. Thank you, Minister Sieber. Mr. Golding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would only add that what gives us additional comfort is the alignment that the John Howard Society has in its goals and objectives to seek just responses to criminal behavior and find ways to prevent and address criminal behavior. This is why I think you see similar programs being delivered in other jurisdictions by the John Howard Society. They've got experience working with individuals that have been in contact with the criminal justice system and are very much focused as an organization on improving rehabilitation. So we didn't see it as a bad fit at all. We thought that this would be quite a good alignment with the objectives of the program and don't anticipate that men who are considering this type of program would have any reservation about going to the John Howard Society. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Golding. Mr. Natalie. Mr. Bullitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, many years ago, there was a treatment facility in the NBT, which was built on traditional model of treatment. Over the years, it changed the medical model, and as the program evolved, they were unable to communicate to the clientele, so that treatment facility was eventually shut down. The traditional model essentially gave one option for certain addicts that would go there to access the treatment that they felt was something that suited what they needed. When they moved away from a traditional model and into a medical model, it was essentially another medical model type treatment facility that was all over the southern Canada that had years and years of experience and way more access to much better clinical people to provide treatment, so that failed. It appears to me like we have a program here that seems to be based on a traditional type of model that's designed to address the issues of individuals that are in the NWT, and many of them being Aboriginal men, maybe most, maybe all. I don't know the percentages, but it appears as though this is moving away from that and going more to a clinical type of model. I heard on the radio that there's an anticipation that this thing would probably run and then just eventually die because the individuals that need to access the program, I think what happened in Atcha J.K. where the people providing treatment could no longer communicate with the people that needed treatment, I suspect that the same type of thing will happen here. And so I guess when I asked a question earlier about the GNWT procurement model or GNWT procurement policies being applied, if the GNWT is going to get a facilitator, the facilitator would have to meet some sort of qualifications. And the qualifications required to do this job may not be effective 
for treatment of individuals that are currently accessing what we can what's considered to be the current new day program that will run out in a couple of weeks I'm wondering if um, there's opportunity and room in in this in spite of the fact that we're using GNWT procurement policies and I don't know how the department or or John Howard Society would get around something like that and um, if there was an opportunity for the same and, and a type of counselor that is, are now delivering programs and I'm not trying to ad, uh, advocate for someone's job I'm just looking at the history of what's happened up here and every time the GNWT has made a decision to move away from um, what's sort of like the a traditional model of, of treatment it's failed so I'm wondering how, what the department feels would be different now that we've moved again away from what appeared to be a model that was working and appeared to be a model that was designed on the ability for the facilitators and counselors to communicate with the clientele and move away from that and go with them and GNWT qualified facilitators or GNWT qualified clinical supervision and what what what's different now that would make this work thank you mr. Bullio minister Siebert well I think it's important to uh, keep in mind that there are not uh, uh, significant uh, differences in the actual delivery of the program what has changed is uh, part of the administration and as mr. Golding mentioned earlier there will be requirement of cultural competency by the the facilitators and um, I am very confident that uh, the program that will be delivered is as good as or, or better than the one that uh, was previously delivered so we have great confidence uh, going forward with this uh, project I don't know if mr. Golding wants to add anything but uh. Minister, thank you, Mr. Siebert. Mr. Golden. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and as the minister noted, is we, we're not making changes to how the facilitators communicate with their clients and what they can do. So we do think that that is an important feature and will continue. Uh, so we're not expecting that relationship to change. Uh, what is changing with respect to the clinical supervision isn't the fact that the supervision itself will be different it's just the reporting relationship of that supervisor to uh, the GNWT so that's not changing either uh, but all of this is just to, intended to uh, help ensure that we have better monitoring so we can make sure that the program is uh, being delivered uh, as best it can be that really is our objective it's not to fundamentally change uh, the role of the facilitator or how that works but it's to make sure that it operates as intended and is operating well thank you mr. chair thank you mr. Bullion. mr. Bullion. <coughs> uh, thank you mr. chairman mr. chairman and um, um, I guess my my concern goes back to um, um, the procurement uh, uh, procedure so if if um, if the GNWT is going to um, hire or uh, the actual individuals that I, I, I believe the the method would be uh, uh, who are paid for a fee for service in order to provide that service there has to be a certain qualifications met what I'm saying is those qualifications is usually education that's that secured as we'll say a mm, psychiatrist um, as a poss possibility um, sometimes um, you need a higher um, education um, in order to receive treatment if you're gonna go like like um, right now uh, we have facilities in southern Canada which are treating people and if you it's difficult to receive treatment if you're not educated and, and and that seems to be a bit of an issue here and I see that and I'm, I, I'm, I can't predict the future and I can't say that this is not going to work I'm saying that this could be a pitfall because um, um, I've talked to people that come back from treatment 
in the coursework that you go through for treatment is is fairly detailed it's, and, and you have to be able to read a lot and uh, you have to be able to work on your own program when you're back in your own room and you have to be prepared to receive treatment the next day and, and you have to be up to speed on these things if you're trying to treat people with the same quali qualified individuals that are used to treating people based on educational models, then you don't sit down and, 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 and have the, a conversation that's needed by the individual that may not have an educational level to receive a, a treatment from a psychiatrist. If we move away from, from that, and we're procuring the guys through the GNWT process. I just, I just can't. It, it could work for some people, but I could see it failing for the most for the for most uh, people trying to seek um, support here. Thank you, Mr. Bolio. Minister Sieber. I just want to say that really the the, the way that the treatment is is being carried out, the the model is is not changing. Uh, there's some changes in the administration. We hope to, we hope that the changes we make will enable more men to complete the the, uh, the program. After all, in the last uh, six or seven years, I think there's been less than 30 graduates. So there were some changes that were made in administration, but I don't think the nature of the dealings between the uh, facilitators, the counselors, and those men taking the course is going to change in any significant way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Siebert. Um, I got a couple of people on there, but I just would like to make a couple of comments here uh, about the presentation and opening remarks from the minister. The reason we're here and why we have this uproar is that I personally think the department and the government has handled this poorly. That's why we have this issue where we are. We're, like, I mean, if it was done right, and we wouldn't have had this huge uproar. And I see this as a huge uproar from the people. It's not political. We're trying to make sure this is done right. We're looking after, trying to make a difference for people. And that's what my concern was. We, as a committee, made a recommendation to the department that we extend it to a year. Not six months, a year. Even though you were doing an evaluation, if you would have done it a year, there could have been a process. My other challenge is, is that it should have been a big warning for you guys that, that what you guys have, the minor changes you were talking about, wasn't acceptable by the, the, the coalition, the people there. So even if it is minor in your the department's definition, it's a huge detriment to the organization. So that is a concern. But it comes back to, again, my thing is it's not John Howard is you changed the terms from a one year to a four year. And you did not go back out to the other organizations. And that to me is a failure by the department and the government of Northwest Territories. We need to be fair and equitable. We need to be open and transparent. We didn't do that. We had the government contacted an organization. It went from a one year or nine months. I think that's what Ms. Green said. It was a nine month to a four-year deal. To me, that's not fair, and that's not open, and that's not transparent. And it contravenes the sole source information that we've seen. Yes, that's an exception. Well, I think the exception would have been if we would have gone back to these organizations and given that opportunity, or put an RFOP out there for a four-year deal. And so why, I guess my question to the minister and the department is, why didn't we do this? Was it just because of the fact that nobody was interested in a nine-month term? So can you please explain to me why, or and to the people, because, I mean, you, there's a rationale. I, I believe you have a rationale, and you're trying to do what's good for the people, And re, but I, we don't seem to understand the rationale, and I still don't know what the rationale is. So, Minister Siebert, if you could answer, or Mr. Goldney, either or, thank you. Or both. Or both. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'd like to say that we do share the same object as the uh, the members, all the members of the House, and uh, that is to uh, decrease the shocking uh, incidence of spousal uh, 
family abuse in the uh, Northwest Territories. Now, we uh, did go out for with the, the RFP, and uh, I didn't hear back personally, of course, from those that might have been interested. There were several organizations that did uh, proponents, potential proponents that uh, attended a meeting. I, I don't believe, and Mr. Gullion will correct me if I'm wrong, that anybody said, oh, if it was for a long term, we would we, we, bid on that. So that didn't seem to be the issue. The, the issue seemed to be the changes in administration, which they uh, may not have uh, liked. At that point, um, we felt we had to uh, uh, regard this as an, uh, an urgent situation because it was extended for six months. If you recall the um, evaluation that uh, we went uh, out for, and, and which was very extensive and was, was costly, I think was tabled in the fall. So we wanted to incorporate the, the changes suggested, which seemed reasonable to us as, uh, as soon as possible. Hence, we extended the program for, for six months. So that's how we ended up where we, we were. We would have been happy if there was um, uh, a favorable response to the RFP. But failing that, we realized the urgency of the situation and then went out to uh, uh, the John Howard Society. I believe others were also uh, contacted to see if they were interested. John Howard Society said they were. And that's why we've contracted with them. Uh, perhaps Mr. Golden could expand on that. Thank you, Mr. Siebert. Mr. Mr. Golden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and to answer your question about why we didn't take the, uh, uh, the, the concerns that we heard as a red flag from the coalition, I, I think it's important to, to, to recognize that the, the coalition operates differently than other organizations. Uh, it doesn't require consensus when it sends letters or no longer, I should say, requires consensus. Uh, so, And we did know that not everybody within the coalition uh, agreed uh, that the changes that we were making were unnecessary. And in fact, we did hear uh, from organizations that you know, welcome the changes as uh, improvements and necessary. Uh, uh, so you know, we had to take that into consideration uh, as well. And we really do want to emphasize we didn't make the changes because we thought we were making the program worse. We introduced the changes very much with the intention of making it better. And I do think we have an obligation uh, to do the best we can with our program. So uh, that is very much uh, the objectives and the goals. And I think we also have to recognize that uh, you know, there, our interests are not always going to align with our community partners. Some might have an interest in seeing things stay the same. Uh, and uh, you know, that's understandable, uh, but that is not always in the best interest of uh, the clients that we're trying to serve. Uh, you know, have, having an interest in keeping things the same is difficult to reconcile with uh, you know, having an interest in making things better. And that certainly was, uh, uh, from the outset, the goal of the department is to find improvements and make this better and see uh, better results as, as a result of it. On the question of the, the term, and as the, the minister, minister has noted and as I noted in the presentation, uh, we were in a different context outside of the RFP. Had we heard in the proponents meeting or in the 50 questions or in our discussions with potential proponents ourselves that that was a, a disincentive to their interest? Absolutely. We would have reservations about uh, uh, negotiating something different. The reality is that we didn't hear that. That was never a concern. Uh, the concern, frankly, from those who said no was either uh, we don't want the market program, uh, on, which is unfortunate, or we don't support the changes. Uh, and we do feel that those changes are important. So, uh, and that's... And, uh, had we extended the program for a year, I think we would have just been delaying the same conversation that we're having now. We uh, uh, very much had the objective to uh, improve the program and uh, implement those improvements as quickly as we can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one more comment, then I'll turn back to committee here. Uh, I'm a former JP. I dealt with EPO's emergency protection order, so I understand that. My struggle is, is that when we talk about evaluation, like in the logic framework, or you guys are working on this presently, this should have been done. So when you are actually implementing, you develop it, then you implement the program, then you have the tools that you're, what you're going to be evaluating. Because right now, what I'm understanding is, is you, 
have a logic model or, or finishing a logic model, but you still don't have your inputs and outputs there designed to see what you're going to be looking at. So again, to me, again, this is a red flag, and I'm not just saying this department. We as government are brutal to do evaluation and to set up logic models properly and to have uh, inputs and outputs so we can identify things. So can you please explain where we are in this evaluation tool? Because unfortunately, I've taken a course in it, and I, now they've sold me on it. So I, I understand the importance of evaluation. So Mr. Goldie. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and we're very much sold on it, too. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we didn't mean to suggest we don't have a logic model when we said we're working on it. Uh, what we're saying is we're working on improving it. Uh, and uh, it's close to being finalized, and really it is the improvements are really around measuring success and having that hard conversation with ourselves and with our partners about what that those success measures should be, uh, and recognizing that it can't just be the numbers of completions, uh, it should include other measures for success as well. So I, I don't want to leave the impression that we're starting from scratch and we have no idea uh, how we're going to move forward. It really is just that uh, component that we have to finalize in the logic model. And the reason why it's taking time to finalize it is because we're, we do recognize the importance of it and those questions about what constitutes success for a program like this are fundamentally important and we should take the time to get it right. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Golden. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you. Um, so when, uh, when the evaluation uh, was done, um, it, it found that the program was deliver, delivering the curriculum that uh, the, the contractor was uh, contracted to deliver. Um, but the department's major issues seem to be with attendance, uh, that uh, the number of people who um, engaged in the program after attending an information session was, uh, I gather, lower than expected. And the other was administration. Um, and so I, I'm not clear what value added John Howard brings to these two issues, and I would be interested to hear a response to that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Goldie. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And it's not necessarily uh, the John Howard that will be responsible for this. I think it's that those concerns and issues are reflected in the changes. Uh, so uh, what we wanted to see changed was uh, making sure that there was the appropriate connection for men uh, that are interested in the program but are not yet ready. Uh, so we do think that uh, we could have done a better job of managing those expectations and that understanding. So we do think uh, the model, including the intake, which uh, will uh, continue and connect folks with uh, necessary support so that eventually they might be ready to take the program uh, addresses that uh, in part. And the other uh, is for you know, addressing the attrition uh, that we saw in the pilot project. And we don't su suggest and we don't want to suggest that that is the only measure, uh, but it is an important one. It does tell us uh, that uh, we should be doing more and finding ways to, to lessen the attrition. We did understand from the evaluation that men who made it to a certain phase and were able to get the 10 weeks in did better and had better outcomes. So it was very much uh, how do we uh, structure the program differently to uh, address that. And that was the change in the model around the increased modularity and frequency of the course or the group therapy offerings and the group, group session offerings. So. Uh, that's how we expect, uh, whether it was the John Howard Society or anybody else, uh, uh, that's how we expect those changes to address those concerns. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Goldie. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess one of the things that's not clear to me is, is exactly what John Howard is responsible for at this point. I note that the contract to the Tree of Peace was $575,000 for two years. And this contract is $577,000 for four years. So they're clearly not responsible for the same thing. So my first question is, what are they responsible for? And my second question is, what is the total cost of this program when you add uh, John Howard, a, an additional departmental staff, 
and the cost of the facilitators. What is the actual uh, annual cost of this program? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Ms. Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the difference between the two um, the two contracts is, as Martin mentioned earlier, the contract with the Tree of Peace included the components, some of the additional components of administration, as well as the requirement to retain the services of a clinical supervisor. Um, so the differences in amounts are accounted for there. So the contract with the John Howard Society is um, specifically and only for um, the services of facilitators for the program. Um, so that's the difference there. We're anticipating we'll have, the, we'll have the contract for clinical supervision directly with the Department of Justice. Um, so that cost will come from that same budget for the program as it um, did before, as well as covering the cost of the administration. Um, it's anticipated that we'll be able to do that within the same um, target that we had for the existing program. So that's the differences that you see between uh, the existing contracts um, compared to what contract is in place. Um, in addition to that, there will be a contribution agreement in place to provide that um, storefront place where men interested in the program will go directly there um, to indicate their interest and they'll be connected with a, with a facilitator. Um, I want to mention too that that coordination function that we talk about that will be within the GNWT, that's something that the client themselves won't necessarily experience. Um, what they'll experience is walking to a storefront of an organization that um, isn't government, as we mentioned, isn't the Department of Justice, um, indicate interest in the program, and then be connected as quickly as possible to do those pre-group assessment sessions with a facilitator. Um, as quickly as possible to me and in, in my responsibilities in administering the contract is within a day or so. Um, so that function where where we as a department are kind of managing um, the data collection and the monitoring and that is something that should be invisible to the client. Um, we don't want to have any in, any experience of someone looking for help to be having to pass from, from place to place. So I wanted to just mention that in our discussion about the differences and the similarities. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Riley. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. So um, the minister has promised several times that this is going to be a seamless transition. We're um, now less than, or just a little over three weeks away from uh, the current service provider contractor finishing and a new one starting. Um, but uh, I'm on the John Howard uh, Society Canada website. The Northwest Territories link, there is none. Uh, there's, so there's no web page for John Howard Society, NWT. Um, I'm not aware of any advertising they've undertaken for hiring people. I looked in today's paper, I looked in Monday's paper, there's nothing there. Um, I understand they haven't made any approaches to the, the staff that are currently involved with the, the, the program is offered through Tree of Peace. They have a part-time person, a part-time office. Uh, how is this organization going to ensure that there is a seamless transition, as the minister has promised? And at what point can we... Um, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Mr. Go Ms. Gardner. Ms. Gardner. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, current, the current contractor has a requirement to um, make sure that men who are coming now and are interested in the program um, complete pre-group assessment sessions with um, the current facilitators, the current staff, um, as well as maintain the contact with them and that support to make sure that they're they're um, prepared to enter groups with any new contractor. Um, the John Howard Society is, is currently engaged in um, finding those qualified counselors and in discussions with several. Um, I can't speak to their, their operations in terms of their website um, or, or that approach, but um, I've been working closely personally with them to make sure that um, that our expectations are clear in terms of the qualifications and the experiences of counselors um, as far as who they decide to approach or if anyone indicates their interest to them, which they're welcome to do. 
um, in delivering the the program, then that's that's how that would work out. I, I think I um, answered that, but I'll say thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Mr. Ray. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I'm just not sure to, what to say here. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm just very concerned this is not going to be a seamless transition and that uh, the people that are going to suffer at the end of the day are going to be the, the people that require these services. So that's enough for me. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Riley. More of a comment. Uh, Mr. Bullio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I, mean, I have misunderstood something, but um, currently you have walk-in clientele that are able to get a service when they walk in, that in with the new group, that a walk-in clientele would be guaranteed service by a facilitator in a day or so. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bullio. Ms. Gardner. Um, yes, currently the services being provided by the contractor um, include that kind of walk-in service. Mm -hmm. um, it is a service that we've we've had kind of ongoing conversations with them about. It's not explicitly what we've asked to have provided. Uh, we're we're wanting to focus. Um, the model focuses um, on the outcomes that we've seen from men who are participating in groups. Um, that is where the model has put the focus and that's where when there will be a difference in terms of that um, but it is what we're what we focus this contract and the program model on delivering is encouraging that group participation um, the most promising results that we had from the evaluation and from all the lessons we've learned is that participation um, in groups provides the best possible outcome um, that we saw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mr. Bully. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, I accept the response, but I, I suppose that I, I always felt like um, the uh, walk-in clientele getting an immediate service was, was very valuable, um, but um, the evaluation indicates that groups are get uh, a better result if you, I guess, uh, it's pre, pre, predetermined when the facilitation uh, uh, sessions are occurring and then people are going there as a group. So I just, uh, I just felt that uh, maybe the walk-in uh, service immediate was something that was very valuable. So that's, I guess, just a comment. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rolio. Ms. Green, and just before we go to Ms. Green, be ref yeah. reflective of the time and that uh, we have there's already another committee meeting um, this will be the last set of questions and we'll and I'll do a little bit of a roundup and if that's agreeable by everybody okay Miss Green yeah I want to go back to uh, what Tom said about the drop-in um, it was my understanding that one of the strengths of that program is uh, as it is currently delivered at the Tree of Peace is that people uh, who might have any range of issues related to the use of violence in their intimate relationships could drop in not only for the to be assessed for the formal programming but to resolve immediate problems that they might be experiencing um, and to provide follow-up to people who had completed the program and, and wanted a refresher, and I don't I don't see that that is possible with this new model because um, the there won't be a facilitator on site uh, where the uh, registrations are going to take place. So who's going to take care of those more immediate needs? That is to say, I show up, I need the service now, like not. Not in an hour, but right now I'm having uh, I'm having this big problem, and uh, and I'm looking for that kind of help. How will that kind of service be delivered? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Gold. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, the member's quite right. There won't always be a facilitator available at the drop-in center. And frankly, there isn't always a facilitator available now. But uh, mm -hmm. in emergency uh, situation, I think one of the things that we recognize, and I, I mentioned in the presentation, is that ongoing need to connect people with the supports that they need. Mm -hmm. So part of that is it's not just a, a client walks in and gets referred to an assessment yeah. and has an appointment booked with a facilitator to, to make that happen. And as as uh, my colleague uh, Ms. Gardner mentioned, you know, we do expect that to happen as quickly as possible. Sometimes that might be uh, during a time when a facilitator is on site, but uh, it might not. Uh, but it's also recognizing that we need to connect uh, men to the supports that they need. So in an emergency circumstance, they would absolutely be referred to uh, community counselors that are on standby for that purpose uh, and uh, are connected to other resources that uh, might be appropriate for them. That is uh, a feature that is staying and strengthened. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Mr. Green. Uh, my, my last question is just uh, is, a, is a detailed question. Um, who evaluates the qualifications of the facilitators? Is, is that part of John Howard's role? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Ms. Gardner. Um, it, thank you, Mr. Chair. It is within, it's in our contract that they, uh, with the John Howard Society, um, that they maintain the certain qualifications, the same qualifications that we indicated in the RFP. Um, so it's part of our, my, our contract management role um, with them to ensure that. So we're, we will follow up with them as soon as a, a qualified uh, counselor is indicated to us that, they, that they're that they going to bring on. It's up to us to get that confirmation from them that they meet what we've asked for in terms of their experience, um, that combination likely of experience and, and education, um, as well as any experience that they have with previous group work um, and a background in, in trauma and, and dealing with men and people that have the types of things that we know people are coming looking for help with. So that'll be done through a contract management responsibility with us at the department. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Uh, just a couple of things. Maybe we'll get a commitment from the minister from with the logic model and the evaluation tool. Can the minister make a commitment that he will share that with committee? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Siebert? Yes, I can make that commitment. Thank you, Minister Siebert. Uh, the second one is, as you can see, this is a very important matter to this committee and to the residents of the Northwest Territories. So are you able to, or can you make a commitment to come back in sometime in September to give us an update in the status of where we are and how we're moving forward on this? Thank you, Minister Siebert. Certainly, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Minister Siebert. At this point in time, I'd like to thank Minister Siebert and all the staff and the general public for coming and attending this meeting. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Siebert, do you have any closing remarks? Thank you for the, the opportunity of uh, speaking to, to you today about this issue that is very important uh, to all of us. We all realize there is a, a crisis that uh, we need to, to address. We've uh, always uh, felt that uh, the prior program was a good program. It needed some improvements, and uh, we are uh, confident to going forward that uh, this program will attempt to address the crisis that we all know is out there. So I'd like to thank you again for your, your attendance and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Siebert. At this point in time, we'll call the meeting closed and let everybody leave. And then, committee, if we could just stay because we have the other meeting to attend.